Welcome to virtual GED class. Uh, we've been in the middle of a data analysis series and I've just kind of slipped these problems into the concept of data analysis. They've, we've been looking at various types of word problems and today we are going to do the culmination of what we've been looking at with unit rates and with different kinds of rates and ratios. Today we're going to be looking at proportion word problems. So just an FYI, the reason why I folded these types of problems into our data analysis series is because of how closely related they are to percents. And we're going to be seeing that next class, the relationship between what we're doing now with percentages, which definitely do fall under the concept of data analysis. Okay. In fact, um, according to the GED testing service, one of the types of problems that you're going to see on the GED are multi-step ratio proportion and percent problems. Multi-step ratio percentage and uh, proportion problems. So um, these things are grouped together by them because they're related and we'll definitely see one or the other on the GET and most likely it's going to be in a word problem. So here we go. Let's figure out if we know what a proportion is. So proportion, we kind of use it uh, in common English, not even in a math sense. Um, and we often say that things are in proportion. We've got GED students here with us today, David and Maricela. Do, does either of you know what I mean when I say that things are in proportion? What does that even mean? So they be the same size? This, yeah, it has this idea of relationship and size. Now, they might not be the exact same size, but they're going to have the same relationship in their sizes. In fact, the most common way I think about proportions is with screens. You know, um, you could be watching this video right now uh, with your smart TV, um, and it would be very large. Or you could be watching it with your desktop it would be a little smaller if it was on your desktop. And then if it was on your laptop, even smaller. And if you're watching it on your phone, I say good luck to you to even be able to see the words on the screen because it'd be that much smaller. But regardless of what size it was, it would be in the same proportion, I hope. I hope that when, if you have this video on your smart TV, my head isn't, you know, all skewed so I look squished like I'm in a funhouse mirror or pulled out long. I wanna be in the same proportion that the pictures look the same regardless of the size of the screen. So that's kind of this idea of proportion. So we're gonna call uh, in proportion being the same relationship, having the same relationship, being in proportion is having the same relationship between numbers. So in the case of what we were talking about, if we talk about size, we're talking about the relationship between the length and the width uh, of the picture so that your pictures don't get distorted. You want them to be in proportion. But you know, those aren't the only things. Uh, Size isn't the only thing, certainly, uh, where we could have number relationships. Any kind of number relationships can be in proportion. So last week, or maybe two weeks ago, I used a word to talk about mathematical relationships. We called those ratios. A ratio, a fraction, basically tells us a mathematical relationship. For example, the fraction 2 over 3, the ratio or fraction 2 over 3, could tell us, you know, two dogs to every three cats or it could tell us three out of every or two out of every three sorry dentists uh, prefer crust toothpaste um, it is a relationship between numbers so what is a proportion then a proportion is just when you have equivalent ratios yeah so everything is the same Exactly. We looked at this a little bit last class by drawing the same picture over and over again. So our only tool that we had last class was basically repeating a picture of a ratio and we called that a tape diagram. We're going to learn more tools today. We're going to do it algebraically, hallelujah, so we don't have to draw little silly pictures every time we take our GED. Uh, but it, the math should match whether I'm drawing pictures or using algebra. I should get the same kinds of answers. So let's just uh, remember, what are some ratios that are equivalent to two-thirds? Uh, four over six. Absolutely. Four over six. And if you're struggling to see what David's seeing, like, for example, if I had a picture... Here we go. There's a picture of two out of three dots being colored. Two out of three dots being colored. And if I repeated that picture, I could see how David got that answer. Now I have four out of six dots being colored. Um, how about you, Maricela? Can you think of another ratio that is equivalent to two-thirds? 
Six out of nine. Absolutely, six out of nine. And it's like Mary Stella just drew another row with that same relationship. And we can see now that I have six colored out of nine total circles. So what are some ratios that are equivalent to two thirds? You know, we have four six, we have six ninths. Well, if two ratios are equivalent, then I say that they are in proportion. Okay, so this yeah. is important information. When two ratios are equivalent, uh, they are in proportion, equivalent, equal, right? Now, I can say that in words, when two ratios are equivalent, they are in proportion, but dear goodness, I am so lazy. You guys know I'm a mathematician. I'm not even trying to spell this much. It hurts my hand. Uh, I would rather say, <laughs> look at that. That is a proportion. Why is that a proportion? Well, it's two equal ratios. Two equal fractions make a proportion. This is a proportion. What I want yeah. to discuss today is what we can do when we don't know one of the numbers in a proportion. Okay, so um, that's the last thing we're going to write down before we go look at some example problems. So let me just clear this screen and take note of that. Uh, when we don't know one of the numbers involved in a proportion problem, we can use algebra to solve for the missing number. I'll give you a great example. My hand kind of hurts. I'm a little resentful spelling this much. Okay, so when we don't know one of the numbers involved in a proportion problem, we can use algebra to solve for the missing number. Really simple little example that you might not need algebra for. That's okay. We'll look at some more complex ones today where you will definitely need algebra. But here's a great example. I'm asking you, you know, um, two to three, the relationship of two to three is a equivalent to eight out of how many or eight to how many I don't know one of the numbers and I could use algebra to solve for that and so um, what we are going to review today first of all is what uh, that prerequisite lesson that I asked you guys to do uh, which is just solving algebraic proportion problems like this one, solving proportion problems algebraically, and then we're going to take that skill that we've learned in the past with algebra and apply it to all these word problems that could come up on the GED. Okay, so I will remind you that we have this wonderful trick we've always wished to have since the beginning of math when we have a proportion problem, and that is the ability to get rid of fractions. I can actually get rid of the fractions in this problem very quickly and easily. And if, if you watch that video, David, then you remember how. Do you remember how? Uh, to separate them? Um, actually, I'm going to use the fact that crossed products are equivalent. And cross multiplication. Cross, mm -hmm. I'm going to use cross multiplication. Cross multiplication uh, is a wonderful mathematical principle that we use uh, when we have a proportion problem. It only works for proportion problems, okay? Um, but it's this idea that cross products are equivalent. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and watch that video, Solving Proportion Problems Algebraically, because I talk about it for like an hour. And I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to use the skill. So my first step is going to be to cross multiply. I will start with the side that has the X in it. So there's X and it is in the denominator. I'm going to multiply it by the numerator of the other ratio. So 2 times X, of course, would be 2X. And that's going to be equivalent to the other cross product. What I get from multiplying crossways the other way. And 3 times 8 is 24, of course. And now I've taken what looked like a very ugly problem, a proportion problem, and turned it into just a little one-step algebra problem. 2x equals 24. Now this is something pretty simple to solve. Anybody remember how to solve something like this? Yeah. You divide. Solve this? Divide by what? You divide 2 by 24. I'm going to divide both sides by 2. So, and I know this yeah. is what you meant, but I'm going to end up dividing 24 by 2. Wonderful. So I'm going to isolate the letter. I'm going to get X alone by dividing by two and multiplying and dividing by two cancel so that my X is alone just like I wanted. And 24 divided by two is 12. Now I have a whole lot of students who always stop me here and say, Miss, my um, high school math teacher taught me the shortcut way to do this and you just straight up multiply and divide and you don't write down any of your work and I always scold those poor students so if you're the one who skips a step without writing down your work here you'll probably get scolded 
because that only works for simpler types of problems. And we're going to see complex problems on the GED where just knowing a shortcut won't work. So you'd better be able to handle it algebraically. So what do we do algebraically? Well, first cross products are equivalent. So we cross multiply. And then we let the algebra lead us to work to get the letter alone. Um, so in this case, I did have to divide, which is pretty standard. Let's go look at some applications of these kind of problems. So I will first start with just the straight algebra before I introduce the word problems. So we just saw one like this, so you won't be too surprised, but let's go ahead and make sure that we have these solving uh, proportion problems. We have the algebra skills down before we add the word problem to it, because the word problem part is going gonna, is gonna to make this a little more complex. I'm asking, do you remember how to solve proportion problems? So I take a look here. This says solve, and I see a proportion problem. Now, you guys, of course, it's proportion problem day. You know, I even told you guys in an email, I told the whole internet there was a title slide. I'm, there's a title up there and it says proportion word problems. Y'all know what kind of a day it is, but that's not how it's going to be when you take your GED test. All the problems will be all mixed up and you're going to have to ask yourself, what kind of problem is this? So how do I know this is a proportion problem? Any ideas? What about the um, so this tells me I'm looking at a proportion? The fractions? Exactly. I have a fraction equal to a fraction. That is what a proportion problem is. It's two equivalent ratios. So when you just see one fraction equal to one fraction, that's when you know you have a proportion problem, okay? So first thing we know is that cross products are equivalent. And so I am going to find my cross products. I'm going to multiply uh, a numerator times a denominator. So I'll do the one with X first, just because I like X on the left, not because it matters. 12 times X is 12X. And that will be equivalent, we said cross products were equivalent, to the other cross product. So I will multiply 8 times 15. And if you had this on the GED, whenever you have algebra or word problems, you have a calculator. So, oh, I was about to do it wrong on my calculator. 8 times 15 is 120. And now this is just a one-step equation to solve. If I want x to be alone, when I have that 12 multiplier out there, I'm going to have to do the opposite of multiplying. I'm going to have to divide by 12 on both sides. Whatever I do when solving to one side, I do to the other, and I do get x is equal to 10 in this case. And okay. that's my final answer. I'm done because x is alone. Super easy, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so just to let you know, though, these types of problems, we looked at one where we had a whole number answer. But as usual, when your problem involves division, a fraction bar means division, you could end up with pieces and parts. Whenever we divide, the uh, likelihood of pieces and parts becomes uh, really real, okay? And so we have two ways to talk about pieces and parts mathematically. We could do that with fractions, or we could do that with decimals. And you might say, well, which one's right? And I'll say, mm-hmm, yeah. So <laughs> they're both right. They both could come up on the GED. So let's take a look at number two and three. Number two says solve, express your answer as a simplified fraction. So they're telling us uh, to solve, again, we want to get X alone, but they're giving us some information about our answer. They want our answer in fraction form. Let's go ahead and take a look. Again, uh, my first step here is gonna be to find the cross products, and I like to start with the X. So six times X is six X, and cross products are equivalent, and I'm gonna find my other cross product. Five times nine is 45. And my hand and my brain apparently are fighting already today, and we're only on number two. Now the next step to get X alone would be to divide by six. That I wanna get that little multiplier six to go away, so I'm gonna divide both sides by six. I do it on both sides because it's a change I'm making. Now, 6 divided by 6 leaves me with x, but then I have this number, 45 over 6. And, you know, I said express your answer as a fraction. simplified fraction. So I want a fraction answer. Okay, guys, so a lot of students will type 45 divided by 6 into the calculator, and they see that it's 7.5, and they write 7.5 there. And it's not that they're wrong, it's just that they didn't follow directions. 7.5 is true, but not what I wanted from you. So, um... If you can reduce fractions by hand, I can. Go ahead and reduce that by hand. That's what I mean when I say it's a simplified fraction. I'd like it reduced. But if you don't know how to reduce fractions by okay. hand, your calculator can reduce fractions too. Okay, so I'm going to do it in my calculator so the whole internet knows how to simplify your fraction in a calculator. You're going to press the N over D button. You're going to make sure the 45 is on the top and the six is on the bottom, and then you just press enter. Your calculator knows all final fraction answers must be reduced, and it'll automatically reduce it, and I get 15 over two. Yes. 
And that is a correct answer. A lot of students don't like that answer. They tell me, Kate, that's not simplified. I got to convert it into a mixed number. And um, it didn't say I want a mixed number. And it's only your third grade teachers that gave you this fear of improper fractions. There's nothing wrong with the fraction 15 over two. It's totally legitly possible to have 15 halves of something. Okay, and it's a just fine number. I, I have no problem with it. So now then let's look at a similar problem, but the directions changed a little bit. Number three says solve. Again, I'm trying to get the letter alone, but then notice this kind of language. Round your answer to the nearest hundredth. There's a clue here about how I expect my answer to be. What kind of a number are they looking for if they tell me to round my answer to the nearest hundredth? A decimal. Yeah, this is some decimal language. 192.88. Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll start my problem the exact same way, but I'll input it differently into my calculator. So 7 times P is 7P. 150 times 9 is what? 4,500? Uh, not even close. No, it's like... Woo! She was not on her game today. And now to isolate P, I will have to do the opposite of multiplying by P. I will divide both sides and I find out that P is equal to something gross. You got something gross, David? Yeah, one or 192.88. Eight, huh? I got 857. Yeah, but you got to round it to the nearest hundred. Oh, okay. I'll do that in a second. I always write down my answer first so people can see how I round. Okay, now for my final act, I will round to the nearest hundredth. Now, I almost kind of agree with you, David. Uh, I definitely know that I'll end my number right there. You're right that it's got to stop right there. Uh, the hundredths is two decimal places, so I chop it off after two decimals. But careful, I'm considering this number and considering if it's big enough to matter. The one I'm about to throw away, and it is big enough to matter, right? It's five or higher. But yeah. the number that it's going to bump up is this number right before it. So the yeah. next number after five is? Six. Six. And so what I'm going to say is I'm going to say that's, P is about equal to 192.86. Okay. I think I'll put a wavy equal sign because I'm an anal retentive mathematician. Have you guys seen that wavy equal sign before? You know what I'm saying when I use it? Yeah. 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 P is approximately that. It's just signal to all the other anal retentive mathematicians out there that I did round. It's not an exact answer anymore. How could we write our answers? Well, there's a lot of ways. They might end up whole numbers. They might end up fractions. They might end up decimals. They could end up mixed numbers as well. Um, and you're going to have to look for clues in the problem in order to figure out which one's the right one. Then let's move on and see this in actual word problems. I'd be very surprised if you saw just this simple on the GED without yeah. word problem context. So let's graduate. We can write our own proportions whenever we have equivalent relationships. Okay. So that is how you recognize a proportion problem in a word problem. You look for equivalent relationships. Let me show you what I mean. And I think I need a highlighter here to order to really show you. Take a look at what this says. It says a man can complete five jobs in three days. Now it says which five proportion minutes. could be used to solve for the number of jobs. And now see, I'm using reference to jobs again. I had jobs up there, I have jobs down here. He can complete in 15 days. I had days up there, I have days down here. And so I have this same relationship happening twice. The relationship between jobs and days. Anytime you have the same relationship happening twice, that's what a ratio is. It's two equivalent relationships. I mean, a proportion, sorry. That's what a proportion is. It's two equivalent relationships, two equivalent ratios. And so I can make fractions out of these relationships, but I have to make a warning to you. So here's your warning. Here's where students go wrong with this concept. Your relationships must stay equivalent and you're just like of course they must stay equivalent and it's easier said than done for a lot of students i'll show you what i mean this particular problem gave me the relationships between jobs and days so if i have jobs uh -huh. to days on one fraction i must have jobs to days on the other yeah. fraction they have to be uh, related to each other. Or maybe I have um, jobs 
I've seen jobs to jobs before. Some people will put jobs in the same fraction. You can do that as long as I have the job that's related to the days on the same, like the ones that are related, they're both on top. So, you know, like this one says five jobs in three days. So then this five would have to be lining up with this three, you know, Um, and then it would be the same on the other one, you know, that job would have to be lining up with that day. So it really doesn't matter how you set up your proportion, as long as your relationships stay in the same order. Okay, so let's make a, uh, take a look at this example then. Um, we are supposed to figure out which one of these proportions could be used to solve for the number of jobs he can complete in 15 days. Now, these numbers all look the same to most students. They look at these four. They all involve a five, a three, a 15, and a J. They all look the same to students, and yet only one of them will give you the right answer. Only one of them do they keep the relationship the same. And so what you should do is you should look at the relationship in each fraction. So let's take a look at the first one. This relationship of five to three is what? Five what? Five days or five jobs to three days. Five jobs, five jobs to three days. So in this one, I had jobs on top, days on the other. So now let's come across and look here. This 15 represents what? Days. Days. This one has days on the top. And what in the world is this J supposed to mean? Jobs. Yeah, number of jobs that's unknown. I don't know it. And so I see jobs on the bottom. And look at that. Do you see how my relationship is not the same? The first one is jobs to days, but the second one is days to jobs. Yeah, Yeah. I've got my relationship flipped. It's not going to work. Okay, let's go test the next one. Let's figure out what, what is this number up here now? That one is jobs. That's the five jobs. Absolutely. Now, the five jobs we said was related to the three Three days. days. So this time I see them going across. And we said that's okay as long as you line up the same way on the other side. So I would need the same number of, I would need the jobs underneath the other one and the days underneath the other one. Does that make sense? So let's take a look. Did they do it? Is that jobs? No. No. Again, I don't have alignment. Look at that. Jobs to days, days to jobs. It is not working for me. Uh, This is not working either. So is examine C and D for me, guys. Which one did they actually get their lineup correct? Number C. C uh, says, Mary Sella, let's see if she's right. So this five is jobs. This three is days and this is both together in my first ratio wonderful and now i see here this is jobs and the other one is days and the other one is days and these are related in my second ratio absolutely this thing checks your lineup is beautiful c would give me the right answer very nice what's wrong with d anybody want to tell me the bottom is not the bottom's not the right Absolutely. I have jobs lined up with days. It's back. Uh, this way, and if I look at it this way, it's days lined up with jobs. It doesn't matter if you align left, right, or you align up, down, but in some way it has to align, and that is not working for me. Um, very, very typical of the GED to ask you to write expressions or equations. So I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if something like this was on your test. Okay, now I'm being a real brat. Look at what I do in number five. You guys know I'm a math teacher. I'm not. Okay, number five says, another man can complete seven jobs in four days. So here again, we see this lovely relationship between variables. And I see that you guys are catching on very quickly to this, but let me just highlight it for the rest of the internet because this is a struggle for a lot of students. So seven jobs, four days. And then it says, which proportion could not be used to find the number of jobs, so number of jobs, he can complete in 20 days. So again, I see this repeated relationship. Jobs to days, jobs to days. It's the same dude, so I'm going to expect them to be equivalent. But I'm being a brat. Did you guys see what in my wording I'm talking about being a brat with? Yeah, the not. Yeah, this throws GED students for so many loops, guys. If I say which one would not work, I'm looking for the wrong answer. So we're going to cross off any right answers we find. So take a look. Which one of these should I rule out because they would totally work? (laughs) A. 
A. David wants me to rule out A. Let me see uh, what David is looking at. David is noticing that A has jobs on top um, and days on the bottom. And then the same relationship on this side, an unknown number of jobs. We use letters for unknowns in algebra over some known number of days there. And we see that same relationship repeated of jobs to days. And David was right. A would totally work, but I'm looking for the lie. So I'm going to rule A out. Any other ones that look like they'll work? B. B, let's take a look. So B has, this time we did our... Uh, days here and our jobs there with my first relationship being on top. And then let's see, we did our, yep, j number of jobs, J there, and our days there. And again, I can see that nice consistency, yellow over yellow, pink over pink, or in this case, uh, jobs over jobs, days over days. That would definitely work very nice. I'm going to rule this guy out because it's not a lie. Okay, so then which one would not work? I'm down to C and D again. I'm such a snot. It's like I want you to look at all the problems. Which one would not work? D. D would not work. Okie dokie. So let's take a look D. at what David's saying in D. So in this case, I see my seven jobs and my four days lined up with 20 days. Look at that. A day's, oh, that's not working with a jobs on this side. So I don't line up pink and pink on top, on bottom, all left, all right. It's all mixed up. This will not work. Definitely. This is the one that won't work. Nice job, job, David. So this is my answer. So we evaluated other people's proportions. Now let's start setting up our own in order to solve for missing and again, thank you guys for having so much patience with me as I highlight these words in the problem, because I have a whole lot of students out there on the internet who really struggle with word problems and to know what to do. So let's take a look. It says Janice can read two books in five days. And then I see, again, this same relationship, the books to days relationship repeated in my question. How many books... Could she probably read in a month? Now you might say, Kate, that's not days. Oh yeah, not yet, but we're smart enough to make that be days. Okay, so let's set up a proportion to make this work, okay? So a proportion is a fraction equal to a fraction. And we've already been saying that there's a lot of different ways to set this up, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what, what you should do is you should deal with your first ratio and then make the other one line up with it, okay? Uh -huh. So I've got, I think I'll do it over here. I'm going to do uh, books on top. It's hard to see that yellow. I'll do books on top, and I'll do days on the bottom, and I'll stay consistent that way. So I have uh, two books in five days on this side. And now it says, how many books? This is an unknown number of books. Well, in algebra, when we don't know something, we use a letter. What letter should I use, guys? B. Yes, thank you. Good plan. Does it really matter? Books. No, it doesn't really matter, but you can help yourself by using a B so that you know, oh, that's a number of books. I better line it up with the other books. And we're saying, how many books could she probably read in a month? Uh-oh. I didn't want in a month. I wanted days. Goody. Absolutely. And Mary Sella and I had the talk a couple of classes ago. How do you know to use 30? And we said there's two reasons to use 30 days in a month. I mean, we know some months have 28, some have 30, some have 31. Why do I just arbitrarily pick 30? Uh, well, one good reason, it's in the middle of those numbers. I like that. But second good reason, it's easier to do math with y'all and we're lazy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> setup is the biggest error made for students. Once they have it set up correctly, they're usually pretty good at solving it. Um, but the setup really throws students. So uh, remember that we can cross multiply when we have a proportion problem. So five times B. Five B. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, sir. I'm dealing with mechanical difficulties and he's doing algebra. <laughs> okay, five times B is five B and two times 30 is of course. 60. 60, and now to solve, I will 60. isolate the B by dividing both sides by 5. On this side, multiplying and dividing by 5 cancel, and I get B is equal to 12. Help me interpret this. This is 12 what? This is 12 months, or 12 books. 
12 books. Absolutely. So in a month, she'll probably read 12 books. Janice is a bookworm like me. This is my preferred way to solve proportion problems. Tape diagrams are useful when you're first starting to visualize things. Don't get me wrong, but they're not really practical when our numbers get big because how many pictures are you going to draw? So it helps to graduate to algebra. Okay. <laughs> okay, look, oh, there's me showing up in word problems again. You guys know how much I like to talk about myself. Okay, so in Kate's GED classes, three out of every four students only need math to pass the GED. If there are 105 students in Kate's classes, how many just need math? So my relationships were not as clearly stated this time. My numbers three and four are not really labeled. So I want to think about this. Three out of every four students only need math to pass. I have two numbers in that relationship. I have the number three. Are you already making a fraction? Yeah. Well, I'm going to do that in just a second. But before I make them into a fraction, I just want to talk about what these numbers represent. What does this three represent? Students. Students. Which students? All the students or the students who need math? Just three students that need the math. Need math. Oh, no. Yes, you're right. That top All number right. is the students that need math. When I say three out of every four students only need math to pass the GED, this okay. four is a different number of students. What is this four? That's a total. So when I say three out of every four students need math, I'm saying, you know, Jimmy needs math, Jack needs math, Tanya needs math, but Bob doesn't. Okay, yeah. Does so three over four. Okay, wonderful. I needed to know yeah. what those two numbers meant in order sure to set does. up my proportion correctly. So David was already jumping to make a fraction out of it. That's fine. But I know uh, that the number on top of my fraction, the three, represents students who need math. And the number on the bottom of my fraction, the four, represents a total. So when we go to line it up on the other side with our other two numbers, I have, you know, 105 students in Kate's class. Yeah, where should I put 105? On the top or the bottom of my other fraction? If there are 105 students in Kate's classes, that yes. represents the total number in Kate's classes. So it has to line up with the four. And that is the most common error students make. I need the 105 down there. You really have to think about what your numbers represent, especially when it's not clearly stated. Now, how many just need math? That's the piece out of the total, the students who need math. So I don't know how many just need math. I need a letter for that. Maybe I'll use M, but I'm making that M line up with the three. The three was the portion in the little group who just need math. The M is the portion in the big group who just need math. If you can't line it up, you'll get it wrong every time. And this is the hard part of these proportion problems. It always is, the lining up. Okay, so four times M now I can solve is four M and three times 105 should be 315. And now it's time to divide to solve. Multiplying and dividing by four cancel, M is alone. And I get 315 divided by four. Now, if you've done it already, you've seen that life doesn't work out too sweet when I do this. 78.75. Go ahead and read this word problem to me. Are there any rounding directions or did they ask for a fraction or a decimal? Are there any obvious clues? Uh, yeah, just uh, talking about people. There you go. That's it, Maricela. There is no obvious clues. They don't tell you what to do, but the unit is a clue. This is 78.75 people and Mary Sella knows because she's heard me say it before we're not allowed to chop up people sorry I know math class is brutal but it ain't that brutal we're not going to have pieces and parts of people all over our page okay so I have to make a decision a rounding decision what do you think I should round this to 79 yes I'll just round up to 79 people no reason not to round up in this case that's probably about 79 people the rounding is implied by the word problems unit i just want to let you know that if you make math work for you you can set up proportions even when the relationship isn't as obvious so eight does not have an obvious relationship so you've got to follow me through my reasoning process don't jump to your setup quite yet so let's take a look at number eight at John Jett's Dance Emporium, two out of every five employees use, uses public transportation to get to work. If there are 42 employees, how many do not use public transportation? This is not an obvious relationship between two things, but it's an almost relationship. 
in this case, I have two out of every five employees. What does this two represent? Two employees. Yeah, two employees that do what? Is it two total employees or is it two employees that use public transportation? Or use public transportation. Exactly. So these are the guys on public transportation. And what does this um, five represent out of every five employees? The total. Exactly. So let's pick a pink for our public transportation. And let's see, let's do yellow for our total employees. And everyone and the internet can get mad at me for writing in yellow. Okay, great. Uh, now look at the second relationship though. It says, if there are 42 employees, what does this 42 represent? The total. I absolutely agree. So that um, 42 definitely does line up with the five. That's another total. But then look what it says. It says, how many do not use public transportation? Oh, darn it. My pink number up there was how many do use public transportation, but they're asking me to find how many do not use public transportation. This is a different relationship. It shares the yellow. They both have a total. But in one of the relationships, I'm talking about the number that do use public transportation. In another one, I'm talking about the number that do not use public transportation. Okay. Now, there's a totally at least two legitimate ways to go about solving this problem. But what I'm going to do is use the numbers that I do need. I know that I need the relationship between employees and those that do not use public transportation. So let me just pick another color. I need do not use public transportation. Okay, so you know, I don't know how many students um, do not use public transportation or how many employees, that's what I'm trying to figure out. But I know that it's related to that 42 total employees total. Now, when I go to line that up with the two out of five, I'm gonna be able to use the five because total employees will line up with total employees, but I can't use the two. The two will not help me because the two is how many are on public transportation and I want how many are not on public transportation. So let's draw a picture out of, of this two out of five employees. So two out of every five employees are on public transportation. So how many are not on there? Three. In exactly. I have this implied number three. These three guys are not on public transportation. This is that blue number that I need. I actually need to line it up with three over five. Again, you could set up proportion problems all you want, but if the relationships are not the same, all they'll give you is nonsense. So you need to make sure the relationships are the same between your numbers. And now we can cross yeah. multiply to solve. Five times X is five X. Three times 42, I think is 126. You guys should totally check me since I'm having a hard day. That's right. Okay, wonderful. Okay, now to solve something like this, how could I solve a one-step equation like this? Five divided by five on both sides. I divide by five on both sides. Beautiful. On the left-hand side, multiplying and dividing by five will cancel, so X is alone. And on the right-hand side, I will get 126 divided by five, which again, won't be super pretty, but we can handle. Okay, so somebody give me a clue. Should I round this? Should I leave this? Should I have it as a fraction? Should it be a decimal? Well, how do I know? Uh, round it. You want me to round it. What in this problem told me to round it, Maricela? Is this talking about uh, employees, about people again? Exactly. No chopping up people. Thank you very much. We're, we're mean in math, but we're not that mean. Okay, so cutting it off at the decimal place, two is not big enough to matter. So I will say that's about 25 employees. So you can use the proportions, even if the relationship isn't exactly the same, if you can go find the numbers that you need. Okay, I think that's pretty obvious, but we're going to see an even trickier one for number nine. We, we okay with eight? Yep. Okay, let's look at nine then. Let's get a little nasty. It says, Brett's dance studio has two males for every seven females enrolled. If there are 135 students in the program, how many are probably male? Let's look at the first relationship. That two was two what? Male. Two, two males. Two males. And that's nice because if you look at the question, look what I see. How many are probably male? So there's a repeat of the male. Uh, but then take a look at the next one. It says Brett's dance studio has two males for every seven. Seven what? Females. Seven females. And then I look and I see the next number. If there are 135 students in the program, what is this 135? Is that the number of females? 
No, it's the number of all students. Dang it. This is different. This is the number of total students. Absolutely. So I can't set up a proportion with just these numbers. It won't work. It'll be nonsense because it's not the same relationship. However, I can use these numbers to set up a proportion that does work for me. That does work for me. So I'm going to start with the question again. I want to know out of 135 total students, so I could put the total on the top. It doesn't really matter. Um, how many are probably male? So I want the relationship between the totals and the males. And I put the total on the top and the males on the bottom, so I better do the same thing on the other side. I want the total on the top and the males on the bottom. Well, I'm kind of in trouble because I know the total. No, I don't know the total. I know the males. I know there's two males, but I don't know how many total this is. So you guys tell me, if I'm talking about a relationship of two males to every seven females, is there an implied total or what? Let's take a look. Here's my two males. There they are, being all male in blue. And then my seven females. Could I talk about how many total students that is? I think I could. Two males and seven females makes a total of how many students? I mean, we could just count right there. Oh, nine. Yeah, and we don't think we can total in a ratio. Why not? If there's two males and for every seven females, that's a total of nine. So I would need nine on the top to line up with my total. My total would be nine, and I should probably do that in the same color so I'm not confusing. Can, can you explain again, please? Can I explain again? Yeah, I'm lost. Sure. I was looking at this statement, two males for every seven females enrolled. Mm -hmm. I know I wanted to use that information, the ratio information, but I knew that I needed the total on the top and the males on the bottom. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I was, it was easy enough to look at the number of males. I already knew it was directly stated there were two males, so I did two up there. But how mm -hmm. did I get the nine? I said, well, if there's two males... And there's seven females, that's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The total of my ratio there was nine students. Oh, okay, okay. Each mm -hmm. line would have nine. If I repeated that relationship over and over again, each time in each line, I'd have a total of nine. Yeah, I was confused that I was thinking in five. Oh, because you subtracted. Yeah. So we subtract when we know the total, mm -hmm. but we're looking for another piece. That's when you subtract, when you know the total and you want to remove a piece, you subtract. But when you just know two pieces and you want to put them together, you would add. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, thank you. Oh, uh, well, that's such a, such a good question. And this is probably why these uh, problems throw students. Sometimes we subtract to find the missing number. Sometimes we add to find the missing number. Cool, now that my setup is correct, Notice how much time and effort I put into my setup. Notice how I labeled my numbers. I was meticulous with it. Why? Because I've never seen a student screw up yet on the algebra. I've seen a whole lot of students screw up on the setup. Okay? Probably 90% of students screw up on the setup. It doesn't matter how good you are at algebra. If you had nonsense to begin with, you'll get nonsense out of your algebra. So 9 times M is 9M. And 135 times 2 is what, 270? And now, uh, to get M alone, I would have to divide both sides by 9. Sure. Multiplying and dividing by 9 are opposites, so they cancel. And I get M is equal to 30. So how many students yep. are probably male 30 students? Now, I mean, you could have gotten this by drawing a tape diagram again and again, but it would take a while to get to 135 students. You draw a lot of little people on your uh -huh. whiteboard. <laughs> So the GED has a few tricks up their sleeves besides just the setup. The setup is actually just one of the hard parts of, about proportion problems. Students can struggle with setup. But the GED has some tricks they like to throw at you. One of the things they like to throw at you is too much information, more than you need. And then you're like, oh, shoot, what do I use here? Okay, so that's one trick. Another trick they like to throw at you, fractions. <laughs> But guys, I'll just remind you again, your calculator can handle the fractions with word problems and algebra as long as you know what to tell the calculator to do. So we just have to understand the operation. Okay, so let's take a look at number 10. Number 10 says, a certain artisan bread recipe calls for eight cups of flour to every one ounce of compressed yeast, half ounce of salt, and pint of water. If Jesse is using 28 cups of flour, how much salt will she need? 
So right there in my question, I see a relationship. The relationship of what to what, y'all? Flour to salt. Absolutely. We see the relationship of cups of flour to salt. Wonderful. And so if I want a relationship between flour and salt, all I need to know about is flour and salt. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's uh, start by making that relationship. 28 cups of flour on top. Again, it doesn't matter where you put it. Okay. It just matters that you line it up correctly on the other side. Two ounces of salt on the bottom. And it says, so how ahead. much salt will she need? I don't know. Let me use a letter. I'll use S for salt. Are we cool with that? Yes. Now, as long as we yep. keep the same relationship on the other side, we'll have a true statement. So what number should I put on top? Eight. Eight. How come eight? I agree with you, David. How come? Just because it's eight cups of flour. Cups the of flour. I want cups of flour on the top. And then what should I put on the bottom? One half. One half. And this freaks students out. They're like, oh, my dear Jesus. Oh, my gosh. Can you put a fraction in a fraction? And I'm like, yo, you just, just write it there. All you got to do is write it there. Okay. We're going to use our calculator to deal with the fraction if it panics you. I mean, I can do it in my head. And some of you guys can. If you can, it's easier that way. But even if you can't, your, your calculator can deal with this. Okay. So once again, even though it's an ugly one, I have a proportion problem. I have fraction equal to fraction. So I can cross multiply to solve. 8 times 8 is 8, or 8 times S, sorry, is 8S. And now I'm supposed to multiply 28 times 1 half. And students panic. Students freak out. I don't know how to multiply. Well, first of all, remember that multiplying can be thought of as the word of. So 28 times 1 half is the same as saying half of 28. Now that's how I do it in my head. Half of 28 is 14. But what if you couldn't do it in your head? You could type it into your calculator. Let me show you how to multiply 1 half times 28 in your calculator. The first thing you're gonna do is type N over D to get your fraction in there. The one on the top, the two on the bottom. Make sure you arrow right to get out of your fraction. And then you will times it, and you can do that with a parentheses or a time sign by 28. And I promise you, your calculator also knows that half of 28 is 14. So you guys should probably try that even if you can take half of 28. Uh, because you might be able to take half of 28, but you might not be able to take two thirds of 51, for example. <laughs> so knowing how to do it in your calculator would be useful. I did, I did it a bit different. 14. What was that, David? I did it a bit different. How did you divide by two in your head? No, I multiplied 28 by 0 0.5. Yes. So anytime two things are equivalent in math, they can be traded out for each other. So David knew that one half was the same as the decimal 0 0.5. So he traded out the one half for a 0 0.5 and got the same answer. And that is totally legit. So there's lots of ways to think about how to take half um, of 28 uh, in your calculator or in your head. But you should have gotten 14. Is everybody good with the number 14? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now let us um, divide to solve here. Divide this by eight, divide this by eight. Something is going to happen in my calculator. Once again, I've got pieces and parts. 14 divided by eight gives me 1.75. 1. 1. Now, go looking in your word problem. <laughs> You know decimals aren't the only way to express pieces and parts. We've got decimals, we've got fractions. Which one should I be using? Is there any clue in the problem? Fraction. Fraction. How come you say fraction, David? I agree with you, by the way. Because you used one half ounce of salt. I used fractions when I was talking about the salts originally. I probably will use fractions in the end. So that's a really good hint. And you're right. I think the answer would most likely be written as a fraction. So just to let you know, you have a wonderful quick convert button in your calculator. It's right above the enter button. Right above the enter button is a quick convert. Press quick convert and they will tell you that that 1.75 is seven fourths. And now I feel even sillier because seven fourths if you ask me how much salt, and I said it's seven-fourths of an ounce of salt, I probably wouldn't say it like that. In real life, if I was talking about salt, I would probably use a mixed number. So we yeah. probably do want to convert this to a mixed number. So that button there. So one and seven-five, right? Yeah, it's, it is um, one and three-quarters is what it's going to convert to. But I'm just going to show you where that button is. It is above the times 
10 to the N button in green there. You're gonna see regular fraction N over D convert to U N over D. That's their symbol for mixed numbers. And so I'm gonna press second and then that button and it does tell me that's the same as one and three fourths. Now, would it have been easier for me to just know how to convert them? Yes, it would. If you know how to convert fractions yourself, you're a lucky snot. It's going to be faster than a calculator. But even if you don't know how, you can do it with guys. So uh, I would need one and three quarter ounces of salt. Mary Sella, are you mad at me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, what you mad at me for? She hates the calculator, David. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if when we start the problem, if, for example, instead that we have one half, if I have, if I have three quarters, can we read it again? The same? Excuse if it me? said 28 over S is equal to eight over three quarters, if it was originally three quarters ounce of salt? Yes. Oh, sorry, yeah. Yes, I could do exactly the same. Eight times eight is eight S, and 28 times three fourths I could do in my calculator. And I can actually do this one by hand. I don't need a calculator, it is 21. But even if you can't do it by hand, you can do it in your calculator. And I do get 21. Does that make sense? Yes. And now I'm going to divide both sides by eight, but I want a fractional answer. So I'll probably type it in as a fraction, 21 over eight. And then I will use that wonderful conversion button to convert it into a mixed number if I don't know how myself. And I would find out that was two and five eighth, five eighth ounce um, of salt. So yes, it doesn't matter how ugly the okay. fraction is. I could have used my calculator and those skills to do it anyway. It's just that it looks just too gross, but... It looks it, gross. It's just so easy when you explain it. Well, and it's easy for me. Like, you guys put things into the calculator and you just hope and pray you typed it right because you're not very good at calculator. Let's remember that I didn't learn to do my GED math in, you know, one semester or two semesters like you guys are doing. I've been doing math for 20 years, pretty much all day, every day. So I'm really proficient at doing fractions in my head. So it doesn't intimidate me. But usually when you guys yeah. see a fraction, either you need all the fraction skills in your head or you need to be really good at a TI so that you're not intimidated by the flipping fractions. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I had four years with you, Mary Sella, we would spend a year just on fractions and you would see that they're not that hard. There's just a lot of different skills in them and they're not that hard at all. But I don't have a year to give you. Like, I don't want to make you hold off on getting your GED <laughs> over fractions when there's used so infrequently in real life. Really, almost the only time we use fractions is when we're doing standard measurements. So American measurements, like ounces to cups, um, you know, inches to feet. Um, the rest of the world uses the metric system, which is based on tens, and so they use decimals. We're mm -hmm. like the only ones who need fractions, and it's because of our numbering system. I do love fractions, by the way, guys. Don't get the wrong impression from me. I think fractions are much easier than decimals in a lot of contexts. It, they just have a lot of skills involved that include a lot of divisibility, which is tech, usually a struggle with most GED students. So I just don't have the time to give it the proper treatment it deserves. So number 11 says, a six foot tall man is casting a five foot shadow on the ground. If a nearby tree has a shadow of 22 feet, how tall is the tree to the nearest tenth of a foot? And see, people say to me, Kate, what, how is this related to what we've been doing? And I say relationships again. What is the relationship we see here? The relationship of what and what? Man to a shadow. Yes, the man's height to his shadow. Exactly. Here, this is a six foot tall man, and this is the man's shadow. Oh, I should use a different color like I've been doing. Do we see that relationship repeated? It has to get repeated to be a proportion problem. Yes. Yes, we do. We see a nearby tree has a shadow of 22 feet. Well, I colored the shadow pink before, so I'll color the shadow again. And then I see this question, how tall is the tree? And again, they asked me in foot. So it's this relationship of height to shadow mm -hmm. length. The man is uh, six foot tall and his shadow is five foot five foot long. So this is his uh, shadow down here, and this is his height up there. So help me to make sure my relationship is the same so that I don't write complete nonsense. I need the height on the top. So well, what's the height of the tree? And T for tree on bottom. Which one did you want on top, David? 22. Ah, that would be nonsense because the 22 is the shadow. And before oh, I have right. the shadow on the bottom, sure. so super important. See how I use the same color? I want that shadow to yeah. the bottom again. 
Okay, wonderful. And don't feel bad, David. Everybody does this. That's why I want to emphasize it so much. Okay, so I got that. I got my shadow lined up with my shadow. Now I need my height lined up with my height on the top. And so how tall is my tree? It's a trick question, right? How tall is my tree? Yeah. Do I know how tall my tree is, guys? Yeah. So no. <laughs> okay, awesome. So in algebra, when I don't know something, I use a letter. I don't know how tall it is. It's eight feet tall. <laughs> there it is, just holding the place for the unknown number. So now I can solve, now that it's set up properly, so 5 times h is 5h. 6 times 22 is what, 132? Yeah, 132. And now how could I solve a one-step equation like this? Well, to get rid of that multiplier 5, I'll do the opposite. I'll divide. I'm going to divide both sides by 5. On the Left-hand side, multiplying and dividing by 5 cancels, so h is alone. And on the right-hand side, I get 132 divided by 5, 26.4. Okay, once again, pieces and parts. Go looking through that word problem for me. Do I have any kind of hints about what kind of answer I want? Round it to the nearest foot. Tenth. Uh, nearest tenth of a foot, absolutely. I have rounding language. With that tenth of a foot, I am talking decimals. Okay, so take a look at this. Uh, where is the nearest tenth of a foot? The four. Yeah, exactly. This already stops at a tenth of a foot. There is no numbers to get rid of. It is done. It is not broken. Don't fix it. Some students are like, I bet, but I have to round. They told me to round. I'll call, just call it 26. That's not rounding to the nearest tenth of a foot. That's rounding to the nearest whole number. So this is already stopping at the nearest tenth of a foot. I am good to go. That is 26.4 feet. Okay, so just write this down, guys. Um, wherever you have room, because I just let you know, they might put that in a word problem or they might just put it in pictures. Two pictures, like a picture of a man and a shadow and a picture of a tree and its shadow. Know that that's that same relationship, you know, height to shadow, you could set up a proportion problem. And we also looked at that, if anybody wants more examples like that, in our geometry unit, we did a whole class on proportions um, of that nature, the picture kind of variety. Okay, so another pro type of problem the GED says that they're going to have. Now, there's a totally different type of problem. They say that they have scale drawing problems, scale drawing problems. But what I say is a scale drawing is just a proportion. Let's take a look at number 12. It says, in a scale drawing of a model airplane, the length of the propeller is two and a half inches, and the wingspan is 11 and three quarter inches. Jack is building an airplane using the plants. His propeller is going to be a one and a quarter feet long. And then I say, what should the wingspan of his model be in feet? Again, I say this might look confusing, some words about scale drawing, which we might never have heard of before, but I see the relationships, the equivalent relationships. Do you see them? Yeah. Yeah, the first relationship is length of propeller. Which is two and one half. Mm-hmm. To what? Uh... 11 and three quarter inches. Yeah, what does that 11 three quarter represent? Uh, the wingspan. Wingspan. So I have this relationship of length of propeller to wingspan. wingspan. And I see that repeated. It says Jack is building an airplane using the plans. His propeller is going to be, so look, length of propeller again. And then look at the question. What should the wingspan be? We're looking for wingspan. We know length of propeller it is the same relationship repeated twice. All we have to do is make sure our relationships line up in our fractions. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's give it a try. So I will do the first one. The length of the propeller I'll put on top. Now this propeller is in inches because I'm looking at the plans. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now as I come to the wingspan here, this wingspan on the bottom is in inches. Is also in inches. So in the drawing, you know, I have it in inches. But then I hit the real world. This dude is building a little model plane. He's going to fly through the air. It's bigger, you know. Um, we, he has a propeller length and a wingspan that we're talking about. So let's go and look at his real-life plane. His real-life plane's propeller length is going to be how much? One and one-fourth. One and one-fourth. This is his propeller length again, but this time we're in? Feet. Exactly. So guess what? Since this side is in feet for the propeller length, it will also be in feet for the unknown wingspan. This is the wingspan in feet. 
Is anybody mad no. at me? So I see propeller lining up with propeller, wingspan lining up with wingspan, inches with inches, feet with feet. As long as everything's nice and lined up, you're going to be safe on your setup. Guys, I know there's gross fractions in here, but I am just going to completely rely on my TI. Um, right now, again, I'm totally capable of doing the fractions by hand, and many of you are on the internet too, lucky you. But for those of us who struggle with fractions, I'm just gonna use my calculator, okay? So first step, no matter how ugly it is, is to do mm -hmm. what? What were we supposed to do first with proportion problems? Don't be intimidated by the fact that there's fractions here. If these were whole numbers, what would I do first? Just one and one half times 11 and three. Yes, yeah, so I would cross multiply. I'm looking for my math language. I would cross multiply, cross products are equivalent. So I will start with this one. And David's right too, though. He could have started with the other cross, but two and a half times W is just two and a half W. And then I have to yep. multiply the other side. I have to do one and one quarter times 11 and three quarters. That's nasty math, but guess what? Your calculator can handle it, okay? So you need the U, N over D button to type this into the calculator. So U, N over D is in green on top of the N over D button. So hit second first. Every time I say hit second first, it sounds confusing, but the first thing you want to do is press the second button, okay? So I'll press the second button and then the N over D so that I can type in my fraction. Uh, the first fraction I want is 11 and three quarters, and I'm arrowing all around to put that fraction in. And then I'm going to multiply that, and I need another U and a, U N over D, another mixed number, so I'm going to press. So I get 11 and three quarters times, and then I'm going to press second again, and the N over D button to get a mixed number. And then I'm going to arrow around typing in one and one quarter. I'm going to arrow out of my fraction before closing my parentheses, and I get this ugly number. 235 over 16. And my students panic. My students freak out. This looks so gross. What will I ever do? You don't have to do anything with it. Just leave it there. We're going to deal with the algebra. Your calculator is going to deal with the ugly numbers. And I'm not done with the algebra yet. Do you see what I still need to do, you guys? Yeah, you've got to divide the mm -hmm. two and one half by the... Yep. It looks ugly, but to get W alone, I would want to divide away the two and one half. Divide away the two and one half. And you say, Kate, I don't know how to take 235 over 16 and divide by two and a half. Well, your calculator does. So we already have 235 over 16 in our calculator. So I'm just going to press divide by. And then again, my U N over D and type in two and one half. And I get that W is equal to 47 over eight. So now go looking in my problem for me. Do I have any clues about what kind of an answer I want? What do you think? Mixed number. Mixed number. David, what made you say we used a mixed number? Because we started with mixed numbers. Yeah, they gave us a bunch of mixed numbers. They probably want their answer as a mixed number. It's a real good hint. <laughs> so I'm going to convert this into a mixed number in my calculator by using the very next button, the N over D convert to U N over D. Again, notice that's in green. So you're going to have to hit it second and then hit N over D to U N over D. And they tell me then that I get five and seven eighths. Five and seven eighths what? Well, the top was in feet, the bottom will be in feet. Five and seven eighths feet. And if you feel like that was complex, it was complex. Uh, that's why it's the hardest of my proportion problems that could show up on the GED. Whew. Intimidate us with fractions while we're dealing with our calculator and our algebra. Thank you for uh, joining us today in virtual GED class. Join us next week when we look at those proportion problems and combine them with percents. Turns out you can do just about any percent problem you can think of using proportions. And man, is it an easy way. Okay, so see you next week.